Okay. Um, so I only have a couple of slides, and I used our default one, so it has that really annoying animation. Um, <laughs> so this is the first of possibly several workshops on machine learning, uh, machine practical machine learning. Machine learning is a large field. Uh, we're probably not going to get through all of it, even if we do several workshops, but this will help give you a sense of it. There is a massive amount of material online if you want to le learn machine learning on your own. And in fact, there's several online courses that you can take. There's videos you can watch. There's blogs you can read. The purpose of doing it here is to do it as a community so we can help each other out and, and answer questions along the way. All of the Mayo graduate students have to raise their hand now. All of these guys are already experts in machine learning. So if you have questions, always ask them first. They know more than I do. OK, so the overall goal of this is to introduce our local community to machine learning concepts and provide some level of guidance through examples about using machine learning tools. Tonight's goal is to introduce at a high level concept of, of machine learning through a couple of slides and then step through several basic examples of linear regression. When we're done, you should be able to take the code that you have and go mess around with your own data. Um, your code, oh, okay, so the code, so can they all access the GitHub repository? It's public. Okay, so all the code is out in this GitHub repository, which we can point you at the end. The server we're running is just a little lightweight VM server on Google Cloud, which will not be persistent. It will not be there forever. So after you're done, you're going to want to download your code or start over with the repository. Okay, so uh, old movies are awesome. Uh, this is a particularly awesome old movie that all the young people don't know, but I keep bringing it back up. This is a breakfast club made by John Hughes in the 80s. And uh, the reason I bring it is there's this great quote at the end, if you haven't seen it, where John Hughes, uh, where the characters write this letter um, kind of describing who they are. And the bad guy is the principal, um, and they respond to him, and they say, you see us the way you want to see us in the most simplest terms, in the most convenient definition. I am going to use very simple terms and convenient definitions. I am not going to be really rigorous, so you'll have to excuse me for that. But the real takeaway message is everyone should go watch John Hughes movies. Okay. Um, this is kind of the classical picture that you see today in any online article about artificial intelligence. This is actually a really, really great slide put together by NVIDIA. It gives us several things to think about. Uh, number one, it talks about the timeline of when these techniques were developed, but it also gives the scope of where these things fit relative to each other. And so if you haven't seen it, as soon as you start looking on the internet um, for artificial intelligence and machine learning, this is going to pop up. So the oldest concepts that we, of, of modern or contemporary uh, artificial intelligence really go back to the 1950s. And, and it's important to think of this because everyone uses the term AI to mean a whole bunch of stuff. It doesn't mean a whole bunch of stuff. It has a fairly regular and well-defined uh, notion, which is autonomous agents, which are able to learn, reason, and act autonomously. Why does that have bad grammar? Well, because the, you can build an autonomous agent that you just program it to do something, and it, like a spider bot, and it'll just run around collecting stuff. That's not really artificial intelligence. The artificial intelligence component is autonomously it's able to learn new concepts based on data. It's able to reason based on those concepts and the data. And it's able to act either physically or by collecting more data or making a decision. All right, And this concept, um, this is really a kind of a holy grail concept. We're nowhere near that. We won't be anywhere near that anytime soon. All right, And really, the reason we won't is because it entails so many concepts particularly cognitive concepts, which we are very far away from understanding uh, about ourselves and how we think. So while we're going to get into some of the technical algorithmic side, there's a whole bunch of other things that fall under AI that are not well characterized. Um, some of the spaces that are non-machine learning AI include natural language processing, interpreting uh, text and words, uh, and reasoning systems. This is building rules. Um, either based on observations or based on a subset of rules to do inductive and deductive reasoning. So that we are, this is outside the scope of machine learning um, for all practical purposes. Okay, so what is machine learning? So machine learning really 
is a large, robust set of algorithmic tools for building mathematical models from data. And again, I'm going very much to the basics in case you haven't been involved in this space, uh, in case you haven't done some of the math that we're gonna go over. So let's just roughly describe what is a mathematical model. Well, it's a mathematical construct which maps input data to output data. It may or may not have good mathematical properties. So we all learned about functions and they have certain mathematical properties. Uh, this doesn't guarantee good mathematical properties. It, um, it may be a function, it may not be a function. In fact, it's often not a function. It might be a composite function. Um, it might be highly irregular. But generally, we're thinking about mapping input variables to output variables. Uh, there are many ways to put machine learning into different conceptual buckets. You can talk about prediction and decision making and pattern recognition, regression and clustering, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to make a list of all the different ways to say the same thing, just Google search machine learning and write them all down. All right, everyone uses slightly different versions. I'm gonna give you one of those versions and then you can take that for what you will. Also, if you go out to Google and you look under Google Images, these are stereotypical pictures of what you might see where you've got decision boundaries or clusters or groups of different features that uh, represent different classes. You might have curves and dots. This is, anytime you see one of these, they're really talking right now about machine learning. The notion of making some decisions based on algorithms. So more specifically, the, the framework that I'll just put up or the general notion I'll put up is the purpose of machine learning algorithms generally falls into one of two <coughs> categories. Again, you can slice and dice that bucket however you want. Uh, one is called function approximation. Given one or more independent variables, construct a model, compute a dependent variable. All right? So we have a whole bunch of input data, we put it into this thing, and then we get an output response. Classification, in contrast to function approximation, is given one or more independent variables, construct a model to assign a label to the output, the dependent variable. So can I label some, some observation based on a bunch of data from that observation? So generally speaking, we're gonna keep them in those cases. Um, you, again, you could do it any number of different ways. When you're building these kind of models, uh, you generally have two different categories or two different approaches. There's the supervised approach. Supervised approaches rely on ground truth data of both the independent and dependent variable. We know the input data, we know what the output was that it generated, and then we can, and these are common terms that you'll use to inform a model, train a model, construct a model. You could use any of those, basically, to build the mapping. So if I know ground truth, I can then build a model, a, a mathematical construct that lets me go from input to output knowing that ground truth. Uh, separately, you've got unsupervised. Unsupervised approaches attempt to find intrinsic patterns or relationships between the input data. All right, so this is where it's just randomly exploring and trying to find relationships. Uh, if you use those kind of two categories, uh, you've got the kind of what their purpose is, functional approximation, classification. You've got different approaches to doing that, supervised and unsupervised. And these are some of the techniques, the machine learning tools that you might use. So in function approximation, if you have supervised data, you'll do linear regression or linguistic regression. You might do radial basis function fitting. Those all kind of fit in that category. Uh, in contrast, more associative rules or correlative methods. In classification, you hear about random forests and decision trees. Uh, or you hear about clustering like k-means and expectation maximization. These are things that we are not gonna talk about tonight, mostly. There's also several methods that aren't listed there, primarily because they can be used for both function approximation and for classification, depending on how you implement them. So like, these are actually quite common you'll hear about. Things like gradient boosted machines, support vector machines, and deep neural networks. These are all different <coughs> ways of doing actually both kinds of problems. Okay, so today's topic is linear regression. Not today's topic is everything else. Just want to manage those expectations. There's also a whole bunch of stuff that everyone who wants to get into data science or machine learning really needs to understand. We're not going to cover those today. I would love to have time to cover them at a different stage. Um, it is, these are not just sort of ancillary, just good to know. These are really critical. For anyone who does this kind of uh, data analytics work, You'll, you'll quickly learn that you spend a lot of time pre-processing or curating your data. So understanding the data collection and curation process, 
understanding the notion of feature engineering, which is used in a lot of these techniques. How do you power study? How many data sets do you need? What about variable reductions? When you have thousands of data sets, or thousands of variables, like in a genome, how can you reduce that down to something meaningful? The train, test, and validate framework for validating uh, your models, the notion of over and underfitting, visualization, model interpretation, and deployment. We're not going to get a chance to cover those. We're really getting to the fundamentals of what is a model, in this case a linear regression model, and how do you train it. Okay, so at this point, that's a high level introduction. I will take just a couple of questions, if there are any. Sorry. Otherwise, Brian's going to take over, and he's going to talk about Jupyter Hub, which is the thing that you just got on, about Python and how to use Python, before we go into the tutorials. Any questions now? I'm still forbidden. You're still forbidden? Can okay. you work on that while I go ahead? Yeah. Uh, yes, except for I need to be into your account. You should you have access to add people. Oh, to add people I do? Okay, I'll work on it. I don't know what I'm doing. That's okay. Okay. Were there other questions before Brian gets started? <coughs> yeah, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Can you get in there? Well, you still have it on paper there. Yeah, go ahead. So if you can, then you, you're a really good hacker. <laughs> <laughs> This isn't working. Okay, so I can sit down with you and try and squeeze it in. But I can't do it because we'll have to create a new username for you. I did. Okay. He created it and just took it down there, and that's the one I sent him home. Okay. All right, any other questions on the slides? Okay, so Dr. Holmes just gave you a background on some of the concepts that we're going to be covering. And what I'm going to do now is give you a background on the technical stuff, not necessarily related to machine learning, that you're going to need to use in this workshop so that you don't get completely lost in the details. So I just kind of want to get a feel from you guys. Um, how many of you have programmed before? Show of hands. Okay, most, mostly everybody. How about who's programmed in Python? Okay, about half. And who's familiar with Jupyter Notebooks? And even less. Okay, that's fine. So hopefully, if you've logged on, you've seen this page, this is your Jupyter dashboard. There's a couple folders up here, uh, a whole bunch of resources on Jupyter and Python and machine learning, more than we're going to be able to cover. But this is out there in case you want to dig into it more later. So we'll start off with Jupyter Hub. If you guys want to follow along with me while I'm doing this, you can, or you can just watch. I'm going to go pretty fast and apologize in advance. Um, there's quite a bit to cover here, and we don't have a ton of time, so I'm just going to touch, just touch, on a lot of things. So uh, on your Jupyter dashboard, you can browse files. All the IPy NB files are the notebooks. So you can open up any of those. They're all interactive. Um, so you, you might have noticed that you're all seeing the same files, and your page looks the exact same. Well, you're not actually looking at the same files as everyone else. They're just yours. Any changes you make are just yours. You won't be interfering with each other. So you can just keep that in mind. So we're going to go and open the uh, file called What is the Jupyter Notebook? And we're going to skim through that pretty quick here. So you open it up. It's going to start up your notebook in a new tab. Uh, so a Jupyter Notebook is an interactive document used to uh, have formatted text, equations, uh, plots, like any kind of output or any code all together. It's a learning resource. It's a presenting resource. Uh, there's three parts to a Jupyter Notebook. So there's the web application, which is what you're looking at. There's the kernel, which is what actually runs your code when you are running the code in a cell. We'll get to that. And then the notebook documents, which is the thing that we just opened in this new tab. Um, uh, Jupyter Notebooks have become pretty popular. More and more popular. More languages are being supported. I believe Python was the first, but you can see here some examples of other languages that you can do this in. Uh, one of the things, 
that you can do in a Jupyter Notebook is use markdown text. So it's a really convenient way to add simple formatting to your text. So if you double click on a cell that is just text, not code, you'll see it turns into this. And so this is markdown syntax where you can kind of pick up on a couple things here where the two asterisks surrounding text, that bolds it. Uh, a line starting with an asterisk, that's a bullet point. If you have the brackets and a word and then the parentheses and a URL after it, that'll create a hyperlink for you. And then when you're uh, happy with what you have, you hit not enter but shift enter and it processes it in markdown. You can see how it format, formats it automatically for you. It's pretty quick and convenient. So yeah. Uh, we're gonna move on to the next document now. We're gonna go to the, um, the notebook basics document. So you're gonna notice before we move on to that this one that we just opened is green. That means that it's running. I talked about that kernel that compiles and runs your code. Every notebook you open starts running a kernel, which is just a process in your own space. And if you want to clean things up and not have so many processes running, you just go to this running tab on your dashboard and you can shut it down. So on to notebook basics. So this document just kind of talks about how to navigate, how to use the user interface and stuff like that. And there's actually a nice little feature here if you go to help user interface tour. It'll walk you through the most important things. You can watch what I'm doing or you can do it yourself at any time if you just want to refresh. Um, so up here at the top, if you want to see what notebook that we're looking at in the presentation, the name of it is provided right there. You can rename it right there. Um, the menu bar, very similar to like a general word editing document menu bar, except you have your kernel, or some, for example, that controls your process running behind the notebook. Uh, your notebook toolbar, which has operations that run on cells and uh, I'll get to the cells right after this. The mode indicator, which uh, there are two modes, command mode and edit mode, I'll show you those too. So right now we're in command mode, so there's nothing. Edit mode shows a pencil. And okay, so yeah, edit mode, you have the green boundary on the left-hand side, that means you're changing the contents of a cell. This is a cell, very small cell with markdown in it. And command mode, if you press escape or shift enter, you'll leave the edit mode, you'll go into command mode, and then uh, you'll be able to work with your cells. And then uh, Jupyter Notebooks have a wide range of uh, keyboard shortcuts that you can use to make your life a little bit easier. It's also uh, possible to completely do everything with a mouse. And so, for example, you can click on what cells you want to Select, you can double click them to get into edit mode. You can see the bar change to green. Um, or if you, you know, are like me and you don't like to use your mouse, you can sh move up and down in your cells with the J and K keys, like a Vim editor, or your arrow keys. If you want to start editing a cell, you just hit enter on the cell that you have selected. And there's a whole bunch of this stuff, and I'm not gonna have time to go through all of it, but if you want to learn how to be a bit more efficient, you just go to help, keyboard shortcuts, and it's got everything right there. You can see there's one section for command mode, and there's one section for edit mode. These are also customizable. If you really, really feel like it, you can go to edit keyboard shortcuts and change them to your preference. So that's all I'm gonna cover on Jupyter Notebooks. They're pretty intuitive, at least I think so. So now we're gonna move on to Python and some of the uh, Python basics, particularly what we're gonna be using in Dr. Holmes's machine learning notebooks. So if you guys follow, want to follow along with me uh, in the intro programming slash notebooks directory, we are gonna go into the var string num notebook. So that whole list of files that I was showing there, I gotta give credit, it's uh, an open source Python curriculum created by I believe a high school teacher in Alaska. It's really, really good. I found it, decided I don't need to write my own because it's better than anything I could do. So if you're really interested in learning Python, you can go out and find it, and I, I highly recommend it. Brian, how did you get here? I'm sorry. Oh, so it's uh, from the homepage. Yep. So your root directory, intro programming, notebooks. Don't have that. Don't have that. Okay. 
try one more thing. Does anybody have it? Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> Sure. So I'll just show what I showed to uh, Ron right there. Um, this, this little folder icon that I'm pointing at is actually a directory. That's your home directory. So you'll need to go all the way back to your home directory and then into the intro programming and the notebooks. All right. So moving on to the bar string num. If you've ever programmed before, Python will feel pretty familiar. Uh, we just just like any other language, the most fundamental thing is variables. You can give them your own name. And what variables do is hold a value. That can be a number, a character, a string, an object, pretty much anything you can imagine. Uh, here is something pretty basic. This is just assigning the string that is hello Python world to a variable called message. You use the equals operator to assign to the variable. And then you can use that variable later on in your program for processing. Or in this case, we'll just print it. And you see when we do print, the output pops out right below the cell and says, hello, Python world. It's contents of the message variable. Um, there's some rules surrounding how you can name variables in Python. Uh, they're pretty normal. It's just you can't start with a number, only uh, letters, numbers, and underscores. And they're case sensitive. Uh, a lot of this stuff, you're, we're not necessarily going to need to know. Uh, I just showed you a string assignment. And I'm going to show you some number assignments and some arithmetic. So here's not showing numbers, but it's showing basic arithmetic. If you want to do addition, it's a plus sign, minus sign for subtraction, asterisk for multiplication, forward slash for division, and then double asterisk for exponent. You know, something else you can do if you want. Uh, you can assign variables or assign numbers to variables and try doing like a var, we'll, do, we'll just print it directly, var1 plus var4. Get rid of this line here. And you can see how I took the contents of those two variables, added them together, and then printed them on the line. So that's all I'm going to cover. That's all I hope that I need to cover for uh, variables. So now we're going to leave that notebook. And we're going to go on to the uh, lists and tuples, uh, Jupyter Notebook in the same directory. So right there, lists underscore tuples. I finally got in, but I totally missed the whole intro of what I'm supposed to do. All right, so. We're going to start off with lists, very common uh, variable type in Python. Uh, if you're familiar with other languages but not Python, you might know them as arrays or vectors or um, that might be pretty much it. Uh, so another thing I want to point out about Python here is you notice that we're assigning the list, which a list is a grouping of values. So you can see we have three values in this cell, Bernice, Aaron, and Cody. And we decided we want to bunch them all together and put them in one variable called students. And you might be a bit confused if you're used to using C or something because there's no data type declared for students. It doesn't say that it's an array or a list. It's just students. Well, Python figures that out for you. When you assign a value to a variable, Python will say, oh, that's a list. I recognize it as a list. I'm automatically going to make students a list type variable. A little bit of a convenience factor, Python. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter. You can use either. Yeah, they're interchangeable. Um, it is helpful, just as a quick Python tip, it is helpful to, um, like if you're doing SQL queries, um, it's easier to use a single quotes for thing than use a double quotes for thing or SQL query, and it just solves that automatically. So when you have more than one value in a variable and you want to access one part of it, you're going to index it. And so if you look at this dogs variable here, there's again three values. And starting with count zero, Border Collie is given position zero, Australian Cattle Dog is given position one, and Labrador Retriever is given position two. 
So if we want to retrieve the border collie value from the dogs list, we use this notation here. We use the bracket with zero in it because it's the zero position. And then we'll just print that out. It's border collie. And all this dot title here is doing is capitalizing the first letter in each word. Puzzle. Yeah. I'm Adam. And uh, so the thing that lists are commonly used for is holding a lot of data that's very, very similar. So you just run the same code on every part, on every element of the list. And so instead of writing a bunch of lines of code that are almost exactly the same to run through that list, you'll write a loop. And here's a very, very simple example of a loop in Python. It has a nice uh, simple syntax for, for the for loop. Uh, so it says for dog in dogs, and dogs is that list that we've just created there at the top. It's going to step one at a time through each element in the dogs list and assign it to the dog variable. So the, it's going to run this same print statement three times. First time it's going to print border collie, second time Australian cow dog, third time lab. And one thing I need to point out about Python here is it doesn't, for any kind of block, so if you're doing an if statement or a for loop or a function, if you don't know what those are yet, that's okay, um, to specify what part of the code belongs to the for loop, you actually use indents, not brackets, like you do in most other languages, and that can sneak up on you, so just keep that in mind. Question? Yep. Does the variable dog get stored after? Uh, that's a good question. I think it's only local to the loop, so it, it'll probably disappear outside the loop. Uh, a question, please. Yeah. Is that a fixed indent, or is there just an any indent? You just have to be consistent. Okay. So it can be if spaces it's or a tab, and it just has to be the right the same. The same number. Same number, either, same number of steps over. So one tab or three spaces. <coughs> or three spaces. So, uh, yeah, so if you'll notice here I just added another line. If I add another space here, it's going to complain because on this first line I use one, two, three, four, four spaces. On the second line I use five. So it just has to be the same number of spaces and the same number of tabs. Uh, sorry, what? Uh, another thing I want to point out here I didn't mention before when I talked about uh, string variables is if you want to take two strings, merge them into one to concatenate them is the word, you can just use a plus sign to do that. Oh, moving on to uh, adding to loops or adding to uh, lists. So unlike, say, arrays in C, uh, a list size is completely changeable. You can add elements to it. You can subtract elements from it. So, oh, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So let's say that we've got our same list here of dogs, but we want to change the value in position zero to Australian Shepherd. Then we again use the equal for various variable assignments, specify position zero of the dogs list, and then pass the Australian when you print the dogs list. So now I'm going to get on to adding items to a list. So if you, this is a, another kind of syntax that you may not be familiar with. It's the dot notation. So if you want to run an operation, a function on the dogs list called, and in this case it's called append, it will add the string poodle to the end of the list. So you can see we start out with a list with three items, three dogs. We do dogs dot append poodle, and then when we loop through and print all the elements in dogs, we can see that we get all four elements. And uh, there's similar methods to subtract elements from an array. If you want to push them, if you, you notice that we added the element onto the end of the list, you can also put them on the beginning of the list. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. I think you kind of get the idea just from this example. And the uh, last thing that I need to cover related to lists is tuples. And all a tuple is, is just a list that you can't change. You can't change the values in it, they're all constant. And you specify it a little bit differently, pretty far down here. So you can see here we create a tuple called colors. And instead, before where we were creating our dogs list and we were using the uh, brackets, 
to specify what the elements are. In this case, we're using uh, parentheses just to let Python know it's a tuple and not a list. So that's all I'm going to cover now for lists and tuples. Next document is the uh, introducing functions. If you guys want to open that up. Um, I don't need to say too much about functions except they're used for um, minimizing the amount of code that you want to write. So say you have a list full of numbers and instead of every time you want the sum of every number in that list, you write uh, position zero plus position one plus position two, you just write a function called sum that takes that list and automatically does that for you. So every time you want to do it, you just say, I want to use the sum function on this list. And in Python, you define a function with the uh, def keyword here. You give your function any kind of name you want, and then uh, you have a comma-separated comma list of arguments that that function needs in order to run. So in the example I just gave, it would only need one argument, and that would be a list of numbers. Another argument you could have is like, maybe, I don't know, you want to do a running sum or something, so you have to specify that with something else. So just like with loops, Every piece of code that belongs to a function is indented the same amount beneath the function name. And then once you're done indenting, when you go back to uh, like zero spaces, uh, you're outside the function and you would call the function just by using its name, the parentheses, and giving it the values that it needs in order to run. So here's, a, here's an example of, uh, you want to print the same message about each student and you can see this code is pretty much the same thing repeated three times, except you've got the names changing each time. So you create a function called thank you. It just takes name, which I believe is a, uh, oh, it's a single name. It's just a string. And all that's going to do is add that text around the name and print it out for you. So you just, instead of typing print in the same sentence three times, you just type thank you three times with the different names. It creates the exact same output for you. And that's the gist of a function. That's true. Yep, yep, I didn't cover that. So functions still return values. You can re return more than one value in Python. I should show you that. Thanks for pointing that out. So here's an example, uh, a function called get number word, and it's using uh, actually if blocks to, based on the argument, to decide what string to return. So it takes in a number, and you can see, so we've got the function definition, it starts indenting, and we have this if statement. And the if statement is just specifying some condition, some, uh, con some condition where you want to run a piece of code sometimes, but not other times. And so if the number passed into the argument is the number one, then it returns the string one. And so you kind of get the idea how that works. So I'm, uh, I'm needing to move on here so that I don't spend this whole time talking about Python. We can get on the machine learning, but there's just a couple more, spe more specific what, parts. What, what subfolder are we on? Sorry. I, I, I'm only at the top level. I missed a little bit. We're going to be moving subfolders right now. Okay. Yeah. Intro program. Actually, no. Notebook. Well, yeah, so you see the okay. root folder, yep, yep. intro programming, notebooks. Now I see it. Yeah. Sorry. I might have gone through that too fast. So we're going to open the notebook called dictionaries now. We're going to cover dictionaries really quick. Dictionaries are another type of variable with uh, key value pairs. And so what that is, is it's basically like a list where you have a collection of values, except instead of identifying each value in a list by its position, where we did like dogs bracket zero, you identify it with anything that you want to. So an example here, here we're creating a dictionary type variable and you can see that we specify list will retrieve the value, a collection of values that are not connected but have an order. And so you can see kind of why it's called a dictionary is you take a, a short value like a word and it returns something from it like a definition. So um, here we're defining the Python words dictionary with three key value pairs. So the key is list, the value is that sentence, key is dictionary, the value is that sentence. And you can see here in the print statement, we uh, 
are indexing Python words with the word list instead of a position, and that will actually return the sentence. And so it's a really neat way to organize data without having to remember exactly where things are in the list. It's just you can remember the name of it and it retrieves more information for you. We're going to be using those in some of Dr. Holmes' notebooks. So I'm going to be changing directories now. We're going to go all the way back to the top. Um, quick question. Yep. So you showed a function example where you would uh, input a number, like one, and then it would output the word. Yep. Um, would that just be a function that just that does what a dictionary would do? In that case, they were very similar. Yeah, you could make a dictionary where you have the number one map to the string one, the number two map to the string two. That's a good point. Got it. All right, so now we're going to go into the ML workshop directory and uh, session one. I'll get, give you guys a minute to look at that and move to that place. Which, li eight, which library? Uh, so we'll go all the way back to the top, go to ML underscore workshop, and go to session one. So now I'm going to open the pandas underscore data frame notebook. So I'm going to have to skim through this. Uh, we're going to talk about data frames and the pandas module because we're going to be using them a lot in our machine learning because we're going to be dealing with a large amount of data. So pandas is an open source Python module. It's pretty popular for data analysis in a number of fields. Um, so when I say it's a module, I basically mean it's a library, if you're familiar with that terminology, or it's a set of code that's already been written that you can reference so you don't have to write the code yourself. It's for really common uh, sort of things that you would need to do. And because uh, you're Im importing it, you can keep your program small, so you're only bringing in the already written code that you need to use. And that's, that's the whole idea. And so in Python, we're going to specify that we want to reference the pandas module with the import keyword. And then that as keyword is just going to give us an alias to refer to it. So anytime that we want to reference pandas, we can use pd instead of pandas. So uh, pandas comes with uh, three primary data types, series, data frames, and panel data. Uh, we're primarily going to be dealing with data frames, which are two-dimensional arrays or you can think of them as spreadsheets that have uh, rows and columns, and you can refer to the data by the row, the column name, or the row and column name to get one value. So uh, you can create a data frame manually. You can see here there's, uh, we're doing it with a, with a dictionary. So I'm specifying a column called breed, which is the key, and a value that is actually a list. So we kind of have two types of data nested together here, a dictionary and a list. And so breed specifies a column with three rows, border collie, chihuahua, golden retriever. And then there's a second column for their average weight that has their weights, which are numbers instead of strings. And so down here, we're going to do pd for panda dot data frame with our dog data variable here. And you can see that's going to make a table for us with the values that we specified. Uh, with large data sets like machine learning, you're typically not going to enter it all manually. You're going to load it in somewhere. Pandas provides a lot of ways for you to load it in. You can do it from a database, a website, uh, or like a local CSV file that I've done here. So all I did was I went out to Minnesota Twins website, uh, grabbed one of their tables, put it in a CSV file, and uh, I used the pandas.readcsv function there to read that into the Twins data variable. And uh, Twins data has a special function that belongs to it called head, and that just prints out the first five rows of that data. So you can see the player names, aver batting average, slugging runs, all that stuff. So if we want to specify one row of this table, we can just do that with the column. So you can see up here we have the uh, column called average, which is batting <coughs> average. And so we just do twins data bracket average, giving the column name. And that's just going to return the index as the left column, and then the batting average as the right column. Okay. When you imported that uh, CSV file, it was reading the column names out of the file? Yep, all that data <coughs> is in the file, yeah, okay. like just raw data. Does it and automatically uh, interpret the, the first row as the names? That's right, yeah. The, in that file, the, the first 
row of values it assumes are the column names. There are flags to turn that on and off. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Holmes. I think he can cover this in his notebooks. <coughs> yeah, go ahead. I just want to make a, a quick announcement, and that is that in case you, you think you're getting lost or you want to refresh maybe what's going on here, because I, I do see a few confused faces, um, we are recording this session, and it will be available to, on our YouTube page for you to kind of uh, look back later and, and, and follow through. The one thing I'm not sure about is we have this up, stuff set up to be somewhat temporary, that what you're doing? Yeah. So, yes. so I guess if you would like to say how long that's going to last. A um, week. Yeah. A week. I'll leave it up a week or so. And, and or, if, you know, we can distribute where all this information is, yeah. too. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, it'll be out there. It'll be available as soon as, we're, as, soon as we basically hit uh, stop recording today. And you can, you can reference it then for the next week or so. Um, with uh, in, and hopefully answer some of the questions where you've where you've uh, gotten confused. Yeah, yeah. I apologize again. Yeah, I had to go really fast. Lots to cover in a short time. So, so, so uh, thank you, Brian. I, uh, for those of you who have done this before, thank you for for re re memorizing or relearning some of this work and letting other people catch up. For those of you that haven't, again, things will be online. We are going to go. If you close and halt that one that you were just in, so now we're back into. The machine learning session one, we're going to go to the line fitting notebook. I'm going to see if I can get through three notebooks today. I might not. Okay, so uh, this is a, a real simple introduction into line fitting. Uh, you've learned many of these concepts already. The first thing that we need to do is we need to um, turn the radio on. We don't. Um, the first thing we need to do is load up all those modules that we're going to use. Now, did you talk about how to run things? No. Okay, so you go into the direct, you go into the cell that has the code. I happen to use Control Enter to run it, and you know it's running because there's a little star in the corner, and when it turns to a number, that means it ran that code. It turns out there's no output there, so it doesn't show anything. Okay, so this is the point where I would like to try and get people doing this themselves, running it as we go through it. So. If you haven't been able, if you're trying to run this code and you haven't been able to yet, raise your hand so someone can help you out. Okay? All right, so you want to start helping people out? Okay, so again, you go into the cell, you hit Control Enter, um, or you can hit the Run button that's on the left, or the Run button here, and it will run that chunk of code. Okay. So, uh, this demo is about drugs. It's always fun to talk about drugs. Um, this is drugs from the 1960s or 70s? 68. So uh, back in the day when LSD was cool, um, they wanted to see what effect LSD had. Yeah? Is your mic on? Just a minute. What? My mic is not on. <laughs> now my mic's on. Better? All right. Drugs. I was just saying drugs because it's fun to talk about LSD. So um, they used to do studies. This is a group of, so this data set is actually from someone else's tutorial. It's listed there. You're more than welcome to go through their flavor of this demo uh, or this tutorial. This is from an actual published paper, as you can see, in Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics, where they gave LSD to a bunch of people and then gave them math exams. And while it might have reduced stress, it also probably reduced performance. Let's see if that actually plays out. Now, one of the nice things about Panda is that you can read directly off the internet. And so this one happens to have, I, this is a, a public Git website that is that whole URL, and all you have to do is put that into the, the read CSV, and it will load it up. So everyone go on and do that. And much like Brian showed, we get the head of that, so we get to see what's kind of going on. <clears throat> You've got your scroll. All right, so there are the top five values. <coughs> Excuse me. And then another function that is in there more, just so you have it for reference, is the describe. The describe function is helpful because it tells you about all of those different variables. So it gives us, <coughs> excuse me, the count, the mean, max, error deviation of each one of those columns. All right, that's just helpful for some, some data loading work. Okay, now that's great to look at numbers. Sometimes it's easier to look at figures. Matplotlib gives us the ability to look at figures. So what am I doing? I'm plotting a scatter plot, taking t 
tissue concentration. So it's the data. I want the column named tissue concentration and the column named uh, test scores, and I want to plot that out. So everyone go to the next line and run that one. And turns out there is a, what we would probably argue, something that might look like a line. That's good because we're doing linear regression. Um, and it looks like performance drops with uh, tissue concentration of LSD. Now, let, let's start talking about models. Now, in this case, a model is a line. Pretty straightforward, right? So what are the two parameters that go into making a line? There's the slope and the intercept. So we're going to use a dictionary here. As you can see, we're going to use a dictionary to hold our model. We're going to make this structure up, and that model will have an M for the slope and a B for the y-intercept. Pretty standard stuff. And then we've got our data, which is this data frame that has our independent variable, is tissue concentration of LSD, and our dependent variable, which is the test scores. And then we also are going to uh, create one more variable in there, or one more column in that data frame, which is the estimate of the dependent variable based on the line. So here you can see we've got our model, and I have underscores there because we have to put numbers in. All right, this is like interactive, do your homework now. Everyone's got to put some numbers in there and then run that cell. And then I'm going to run it with the way that I would figure it out. So go ahead and look at your data, look at the plot, look at the table. Maybe you want to look at the summary table up above. And everyone put a number in and see what happens when they get that model out the other side. Replace the underscore with numbers. That would maybe be a reasonable guess for the slope and the intercept. Or it could be a terrible guess. It doesn't matter to me. Anyone want to give me a strategy? I'll type it in here for everyone. All right, so if I remember correctly, slope is change in y. Someone want to give me my change in y? 80 minus 30? Sorry, what? 42. 80 minus 42, okay. So you need 42 minus 80. Oh, 40, what is it? Wouldn't it be the... Uh, it doesn't matter because it gets, it works out with slope. Okay. Someone want to give me some numbers on the bottom for the X difference? 80 was like 6.5 minus 1, or do I have that right? Someone's got to go up and look at the plot. I'm too lazy to look. All right, I'll do it. So uh, 80 down to 42, someone said 42, that's over there, and that difference is from 1 to 5.5. So I'm going to just put that in. Oops. Okay. And then someone want to give me a B just by, again, looking at the plot. What is it? 30 is the y-intercept? That feels unlikely. I'm going to go with 80. Maybe. Near 90. Closer to 90? Sure, well, let's put in 90. All right. So uh, that's, pra I mean, that's just practical drawing a line stuff, right? And if we run this, it says my model has an M of minus 8.4 and a B of 90, which is good because that's what we would hope. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create this data frame, which is my tissue concentration that I'm calling X. And my independent variable, or my dependent variable y, which is a test score, and then I'm going to run my model, where I'm going to take the m times all of my x's plus b and put that into my estimate. So let's see what we get. All right. So there, everyone just has to run that cell, and what we see is that we have our x values here, our y values here, and our estimate, which I call y underscore, is shown as well. All right. And while, again, it's fun to look at tables, sometimes better to look at plots. Let's take a look at the plot. That's the next line. That's not a bad fit, right? So we see we've got the red dots. Notice I've got scatter, scatter. So those are my scatter plots, the red dots and the green dots, and then the line that goes that represents my model fit. Are we all here? Right? If anyone has questions, that's fine. You just got to raise your hand. Anyone else? So when it comes to machine learning, 
um, we need to determine if that's a good fit or not, right? I mean, this could be a horizontal line. It's a fit. It's not a good fit, but it's a fit. What do we do? Well, uh, the, a common metric that many of you might have learned before is trying to look at the difference, for example, between points. So I've added a delta to my model data. You can see it there. I take my y's and my y underscores, and I create a delta. So now what that tells me is how far off are my best guesses. And that's helpful. The problem with it is that's both positive and negative numbers. And so if I wanted to like sum up to get my total error, that doesn't work. And so I need some way to uh, make those consistent. So I'm going to square them. So now I've squared them. And now here under the squared column, I see this is how my errors add up. And in fact, you can see while some of them have very small error, like the first one, uh, some of them, like the third point there, or the fourth point, has a lot of error. That still might be our best model. We don't know, but it is a model. And this, when you then normalize it, becomes the, the uh, sum of squared errors, which is a common term used where we calculate the sum of the squares as an error metric. So overall, the error between my model and the data points is 48. Did anyone get another number? Did anyone put in a different number for their slope intercept? What'd you put in? Um, I said that the intercept was zero. Okay, and what did you put for a slope? Um, 50 over negative 5.5. Okay, so I, I think that probably you got your X and Y's a little mixed up. What did you get for an error? Uh, 38.4. 38.4? Better at all. That is better. I wonder what happened there. I want to see. So I'm going to, maybe everyone, anyone else who wants to do this, I'm going to do this. we got the time. What, what was your um, slope? Uh, 80 minus 30 over 1 minus 2.5. Oh, okay. Um, and then what was your intercept? 88. 88. All right. Now, and you do need to go through each of those steps because of the intermediate ones are cal recalculating. That is correct. Yeah, so that's the thing about Jupyter Hub. Things are done in order. So if you back up, then your values down below are no longer valid. Now, what you can do to address that for anyone that cares is you can actually rerun all of your cells again. So you can make a tweak and run the whole thing again, or you can do it a cell at a time, which is what I did. Anyone else want to give a guess? That, I guess, was pretty good. Okay. So, 38. Not, not too bad. Now, eventually what we'll learn in, in later courses is sometimes you have these outliers, things that are really way far off the curve, and your linear fit tries to fit to that. And really it shouldn't because it's an outlier. And so there's different strategies to deal with outliers. For example, what's called penalized regression, which we're not going to do today. But in this case, the outliers kind of sit in the middle and they balance themselves out if you take a look at our, our plot. So you can see we've got a couple outliers, but they're sort of balanced on either side. All right. Uh, questions on this? You can take this home and play with it if you want to do more of this manual stuff. What this is motivating is... How do we then start to build a method to automatically find that best, lowest error? Okay? All right, I'm going to suggest everyone go to File, Close, and Halt. And we're going to go on to linear regression. <laughs> now, uh, this particular one has some math in the middle. Um, I generally don't mind math, although it's calculus. I don't like calculus, just like I don't like physics. So uh, we're going to have to fight our way through it, but I think we'll do that together. So linear regression is the process now of doing that model fitting and adding some automation to it to kind of get to that minimum. And it's important to do this as an exercise because almost all mach supervised machine learning algorithms use this notion of finding a minimum or optimizing to a minimum in order to solve them. So here we're going to, again, go to our first cell and we're going to run that. All right, so pretty much all of this is the same, except for this 
Weird thing, at, I put at the bottom, you don't really have to care about it. All that does is makes the output prettier. Okay, so again, drugs. We like to talk about drugs. There we go. Um, we're going to pull our data. We're going to set up our model. Remember, we have this generic form of storing the M and the B. And then we also have our data frame of the data itself. So we've got our model, we've got our data. So we have to reload that because we exited Python. We're going back in. So let's do that. There we go. So my model is generically set to M and B. Um, and there's my X, Y, and it does a first estimate of, or it doesn't do, it does a first estimate, but there's really nothing there. So I just filled it with zeros. Now, uh, I am going to take a minute. There we go. To talk. And, and this is where we get into a little bit of calculus. Uh, I'm going to go over here and talk about gradient descent. Who here knows what gradient descent is, the algorithm gradient descent? Some people? OK. So um, back in the day when we all had to do calculus and be angry with our math teachers, um, we learned about the notion of the gradient. So if I've got some sort of curve like this, all right, and I'm sitting at some point on the curve, and I don't know where to go. All right, I'm sorry, before we get to that, if I'm sitting on the point of the curve, I know a few things. I know the point of the curve, but if I know the, the, um, the closed form solution of the function, that is, I know the function itself, I can calculate the gradient. Gradient is the tangent line in the, in the first, in a, in a single variable case. Gradient in a higher order goes along all the different axes. But for now, we've got this line here that says, what is my tangent? Remember, the tangent is basically as close to parallel to that point as you can get. And the reason that we're talking about the gradient, um, or in this case, the tangent line, is because in gradient descent, uh, if you're here and you know your gradient, you can use that to guide your next step as you try and move downhill. So the whole point is without knowing the function, I want to know how to get here. Okay, I want to find that minimum. Well, I can use the gradient at this point, which I do know because I know the point, and I even know adjacent points if I have to estimate the gradient, to get the gradient line. And the gradient line, if I'm on a curve, is going to point downhill. And so I've got this line that points downhill, bam, if I use that correctly, I know which direction to go. Now, that doesn't always work. Check this out. If I'm way over here, right, my tangent line or my gradient's like that, if I follow that, I go way over here, which kind of overshoots it, right? I want to get down here. But it turns out in sort of an optimal sense, if you have what's called a well-formed curve, like this is, or a well-formed function, you can go from here to here, and it still gets me down close to the bottom. All right, this is the magic of gradient descent, and it is why it is the basis for nearly all, not all, but nearly all optimization strategies. Um, it requires that you know a point, you know how to calculate the function at that point, even if you don't know the minimum, and it requires some, what's called a well-formed <coughs> curve. If your curve looks like that, then you got a problem, because I'm going to go from here, it's going to shoot me over there. Oh, wait, I didn't do that very Let's put that guy way down there. It's going to go from here, shoot me over there, and then from here, it's going to shoot me down there, and then I'm stuck. And that concept is called the local minima. And I'll, I'll revisit that if we, if we go further down the road with these. But the point is, at first approximation, we use the gradient or the tangent line to guess what our next step is. Okay? So, does anyone have questions? We're okay still? All right. Um, so we have this notion of, of y equals mx plus b, pretty straightforward notion. And if we take each of our samples, call them x sub i and y sub i, referring to the first sample and the second sample and the third sample, we can calculate for all the points that we know, we can calculate their x's and y's. The model we're building is if given some other x, what is our estimate of y? So that's where we need to figure out what is m and b. And the error, the one error that we looked at before is basically this mean squared error where, again, we're looking at the difference between what we want. I'm sorry, this is what, this is what we know or what we want, and this is our estimate. And we want to minimize that thing. So we want to go down that slope. 
Now, this is, uh, again, our only hairy math, and if you can, I highly recommend you go through this yourself sometime so you understand it. After, after you do that, you can forget it, but it's worth understanding it. Um, and the way it works is this, the gradient or the derivative, if you will, this is called the partial derivative on that function. You do it for each one of your parameters. So we have an M and a B that we're tweaking, and so we have to take the gradient of those. So we take the, 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 the partial derivative of that error function. Where did my error function go? There we go. Partial derivative there. So my partial derivative of this whole thing. Um, it turns out that if these are all summed, and so you actually can move that partial derivative inside of that summation. And so really it's the sum of the partial derivatives of every pair of the difference between yi, which we know, and y underscore i, which, which is our best guess. Now, for those of you who dislike calculus as much as I do, you'll recognize this next step is the chain rule. The chain rule is a way of doing more complex, to calculate the derivative of more complex functions. And basically, that 2 comes down from up in the exponent. So you can see a 2 is moved out in front of it. Here's the 2. It's now out in front of it. And then you take the derivative of what's inside, which actually gives us a minus x sub i. Okay, so now we have, and then... Uh, to put it back into simple terms, what the derivative of the error function is, is 2 over n, the sum of x minus x sub i times uh, the quantity or the delta between our two values, what we know and what we're estimating. Okay? And it turns out b is actually a little bit easier because we don't have the x sub i in there. And so it's uh, almost the same, but not quite. We're missing an x sub i. That is the, that is the solution of the derivative of the error function. It means we don't know b and we don't know m, but we know it locally so we know where to go. Okay? Again, if you don't know this um, and you want to, you should look this up uh, or refresh yourself on it. it. This is the basis for all of the optimization that we'll probably be talking about. Are we okay? Does anyone want to talk about that? Okay. So um, let's get back into our code. So now I'm creating functions this time because copying and pasting over and over again, that's not very much fun. So I've got a function here called compute model and error. And what you see, it takes the model and it takes the model data from the model M and the model B. I can put all my model data in it and get my estimate. All right? I can then calculate that sum of squared or that mean squared error, which is the delta between the two. I can square it and then I can sum all those things up. All right, it is literally what you see when you run this error function right here. That is all I've computed. I've calculated the y sub i, the delta between them, I've squared, and I've uh, summed it up. All right, so let's go ahead and run that code. It doesn't create out quick because it just made a function. And now we're going to run um, the gradient calculation. So remember the gradient, which is right here, in this case, this is the gradient for b, is 2 over n sum of the minus of y i and minus y bar or y underscore. So what we do is we, we're going to add up all our gradients in there. And for each model point that we have, for every x that we know, we calculate the gradient. And, and I'm not going to take the time to do it, but basically these two lines here correspond directly to the math that's above there. And then we normalize it with the 2 over n. All right, so let's all run that. Has everyone run all this code so far? No problems. There's no weird outputs or anything? Okay. So, so now we have the gradient. Remember, gradient descent actually takes the gradient and steps down it. Now, one of the problems is if I set a gradient that's much, much too large, or I'm sorry, if I, so that step from one spot to the next is called the learning rate. How big of a step? If you take really big steps, you might miss that little minimum that you want and jump past it. All right, if you take two tiny steps, it takes you forever to get to point A to point B. So we've got gradient descent here. What we need to choose is, if I'm going in this direction, how far in that direction do I want to go for each of my parameters? In this case, we're going to use the same step size for both M and B, but you don't have to. So um, the gradient descent function takes our model and our model data and the learning rate, it calculates the mean squared error, which is, again, um, based on what we know of the gradient of the mean squared error. That's that previous function. And then given that, we can update our model M 
in our Model B based on that learning rate. So we start at where we are and we step forward some amount. Again, remember, if it's too small of a step, then I'm going to be up here and I'm going to take a tiny step, tiny step, tiny step, tiny step. It's going to take me a really long time to get there. If it's too big, I'm going to jump over here, jump over here, jump over here. All right, so there's magic. And it's definitely magic if you're doing it by hand. There's magic about how to choose that learning rate. So let's do our, let's run that function. And now we get to apply the learning. So here, remember, uh, this is where you guys get to put in stuff again. So I'd like everyone to put in a learning rate. I'd like everyone to put in a slope and an intercept. All right, you can put in whatever you want. Maybe you want to make it close to start. Maybe you want to try it when it's not close to start and see what happens. All right, so while you guys are putting those in, I'm just going to briefly talk through the rest of this code. So I put in my learning rate, my model, and my initialized model of M and B. I'm going to compute the error off that. I'm going to print that out, and I'm going to do some plots. And then in my, so I'm going to compute the model, and then I apply the gradient descent algorithm, which we just covered, and then I'm going to compute the new model and see how well I did. All right, so who wants to give me a set of numbers? No one wants to give me numbers. All right, well, I'll make up numbers. Let's see here. Remind me of your example of how not to do it. Good, I'm ready for that. What do you got? One for learning rate. Ah, yeah, okay. And your M? Uh, minus seven. Minus seven. And 85. And 85. Okay, so I'm going to run this so we can check it out. And so when I run it, it generates some great output. Let's see what we learn. Okay, so minus 7, 85. It, initially, it gives an error of 70.23. It runs a model, runs a model. Oh, look at that. We are way out of whack. So where our initial guess was here, it was a reasonable initial guess. At the end, after running this model, we are nowhere near our data. All right? We took off and went out somewhere else. So what might we do to fix that? Decrease the learning rate. That is correct. Someone want to give me a different learning rate? Oh, good. I'm glad you went that small. Okay, so let's take a look at point zero 0.01. Rerun it again. Okay, let's see what's different. If we take a look at our M and our B, all right, it's minus 7.5 and 4.9. That's pretty close to where we started, right? We didn't get much change there. And our MSE is 48. Now remember when we did it by hand, we got down to 38. So now we're moving really slow. We're tweaking these things just a little bit at a time. What might we want to choose? That's correct. Anyone want to give me one? Okay, good. So point two, let's see how we do. Oh, that's still a bit off. Our MSE is 2104. So, um, as it turns out, while it's a ton of fun to just keep putting in random stuff, I feel like we should be able to do better than that. All right? So, that was just one run. Let's see what happens when you do lots of runs. And actually, I'm going to cheat because I know a really good answer, which is 0.01. And uh, was it 50? No, what was it? About 50? Oh, no. 85 down here. And minus 7? Okay. Someone beat me to it and see what happens. Okay, so now... What I've done is I've put this into a loop. So rather than just running it one time, I'm running it 10 times over and over and over again. So now let's see what happens in our final model. 
Look at that. There's our final model. Our MSE is at 38.8. So whoever guessed that 38, they've done pretty well because that's the best after 10 iterations of our gradient descent that we got. All right? So what's the difference? Last time it was just one at a time. We tweaked it one at a time. This time we run it 10 times. It's step, 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 and it got to an answer. And the answer is minus 8 for the slope and 84.89 for the y-intercept. So, so did it really do much? Well, let's find out. If you go here to this last one, what you see is three plots. It shows over time what is our M, what is our B, and what is our error. So you can see that it's kind of getting a larger negative number there and a smaller slope, and our error drops from 70 to 48 to 41 and so on. Look at this. This is a plot of the M over time. So it's kind of converging, right? Our B over time that started to converge and said, well, I don't like that. I'm going to change directions. And then our MSE, which really tapers out to something really close to what we guessed by hand. Okay? So this is a way to interpret the learning of that model. Questions? It's okay. You can hold the applause to the end. I'm, I'm all totally good with that. All right. <laughs> so anyway... Uh, this is, from scratch, building up a linear regression model, all right? Uh, we have 10 minutes left, and I do want to go over this last one. It won't take very long. Does anyone have any questions about any of what we learned in this session, this section here? Yeah? How is that learning rate tied to the effectiveness? Ah, well, put in a different learning rate. Put in, uh, let's, let's go back to someone had recommended like a, a 1. Oh, okay, I'll show you the math in a second. But what's important, it's still worth looking at the impact that it has. Um, and then I'll show you where it, where it actually occurs. So there, that learning rate, you're just like taken off. You're so far away. Okay, so mathematically, where does that learning rate come in? I'm sorry, I went pretty quick over that. If we go to our function up here called gradient descent, all right? We take the model, the model data, and the learning rate. What it does is it takes the point you're at. So let's say this is the curve of my B's. All right? It takes my B value here, which I don't know what the number is, but there's a number here. We'll call it B sub 1. All right? And it takes the gradient or the slope and it says, B sub 1 plus some distance along this line, make that my B sub 2. So if I take B sub 1 and I go along this line, and, and let's say my distance is, well, this is my learning rate. Okay, then this is my B sub 2. So the learning rate is used as an update mechanism. It takes where you are, which you can see model M or model B, minus the learning rate times the model the gradient. So the learning rate basically is a scale factor for how big of a step are you taking on every one of your steps. Okay? Other questions? Okay. You've got a simple set of data that looks very linear and you take too big a step and it just explodes. That's correct. That's correct. And that's one of the problems with a standard gradient descent. So um, choosing in, in advanced uh, techniques, what you do is you vary your learning rate based on how far you've moved on every step. And so you can actually tweak that. We chose a fixed learning rate, but we get smaller and smaller and smaller. But yes, you're correct. Okay. We're going to close that one. Last one's actually be pretty quick. There's not too much to do in it. Um, so again, while that is incredibly fun to manually tweak numbers, um, as a developer or an an a data analyst, you might want to do something more automated and not have to write your gradient functions every time because, well, you might enjoy math. You might not enjoy it that much. So it turns out someone has done this for us, and there is a package. It's called Scikit. Um, Scikit Learn. You can see it there at the top. Scikit Learn is a collection of, quote, simple and efficient tools for data mining and data analysis. They have done all the work of calculating all your gradients for all the multivariable kind of linear regression models that you want to use. 
And so now all that stuff that we just learned, which is good to understand the fundamentals, for example, why the learning rate's important when you're doing gradient descent, this helps take care of that so you're much quicker. So uh, SK Learn is the package, and then the subsection or the, the components that we're using here are called uh, linear model. So let's everyone run that one. Now we're going to switch to some slightly more extensive data. Um, this is about Swedish people. Uh, and so what we have here is the auto insurance claims given the total number of claims. So are claims getting bigger or small, smaller? So if we know the number of claims, can we determine um, predicting, if we know the number of claims, can we determine the payout for all the claims together? Somewhat a trivial idea, we'll get into something far more complex. Here again, I'm reading off the internet directly, but I'm reading an Excel file, so that's handy, right? We don't have to like convert things to CVS or anything, we can just pull it right down. And I'm just gonna run that one if you haven't done it yet. Oh. Yeah, that's what I got. What? Okay. <laughs> this is, this is uh, Brian's fault. <laughs> Hold in there. All right. Um, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do, and now all you guys can do is watch me because I don't have time to fix that for everyone, is I'm gonna run my version of it, which I know works. Um, so basically what that says is that there's a module that's not installed related to reading Excel files. And since we didn't copy the Excel files locally, I need to do it this way. So, um, come on. All right. So that, that could be Sweden for all I know. I don't, I don't know. All right. So uh, where is my, I got my local copy here. Uh, local. Okay. So linear regression. Give me just a second to catch up. Okay, let's see if mine loaded correctly. Oh, it's still, it's still pulling data. Come on. All right, so it ran that, it ran that. Okay, so here's what the data looks like. All right, so that's their data. Um, now, remember we had done all that work to calculate gradients and, and MSEs and all that stuff. Things get a lot easier here, and you can follow along, but you just can't run it. So in this case, all of our input or independent variables are put into a data frame. We only have one. We have the X, so we're going to do that. And then we've got the output, which is just a series. Uh, Brian covered that we have data frames, which are like spreadsheets. Series are just like a, a series of numbers in a row. Here, we say we want a linear regression model, and we go fit. And then we run predict, and predict tells us how well we did. And that's about as simple as it gets. So instead of running all that code ourselves, we get to use this. We say we want a linear regression. We're going to fit um, our x's to our y, and then we're going to predict based on those x's. And then we get a root mean squared error, and we plot it out. All right. So, uh, so that is really simple, because I just want you guys to know you don't have to write all of those gradient descent functions. They're all built in for you. The last little bit, and Actually, this data set will work. So if you guys have your stuff open and you go towards the bottom, there is this section called multivariate linear regression. So I have given an example of where we've got one input and one output. What if we've got multiple inputs and multiple outputs? How do those interactions get calculated? Well, I'm not going to show you all that math. All I'm going to do is tell you to uh, run multivariate regression within this sklearn package. So here, this is a common data set that's looked at because there's a lot of interesting features in it. Uh, and it's called, the, uh, it's called Boston. Um, when you load the Boston data set, you get a bunch of junk that's pretty much not readable. But fortunately, it tells you how to, to read those things. So inside it, you've got your data, you've got your description, you've got your feature names. So I just printed that out. So this is Boston housing prices based on a variety of features like nitric oxides and average number of rooms per dwelling and stuff like that. And so you can use that then to create a new data frame. So I'm saying my Boston data frame takes my data, 
and then the feature names, which I have listed right there, and then I also add the target. That's my output dependent variable. And now I've got a table. And, and compared to how this used to be done by hand, we had to munge a bunch of data in Excel, this is pretty darn slick that you can load your data up and quickly define it into a data frame. Anyone try and run this? Did it work for you? Did it work? Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right, well then fine. Then you guys have to do a little bit more homework. Last one of the night. Um, let's take a look at two features and see how they interact. So here, where it says feature one and feature two, I want you to replace that with just a couple column names. For example, you might want to put Knox as one of them and RM as one of them. And if you run that, what it'll show you is some plots. All right. In this case, it turns out um, the median value of the home compared to Knox isn't very interesting, but boy, that RM one is really interesting. Did anyone choose a different one? ZN? What does ZN tell us? Boy, that's all over the place. It's possible, and we haven't talked about high dimensional um, statistics to know what that looks like. It's possible that could be meaningful. Turns out there's one that's pretty well known. Anyone try a different one? I'm not getting the chart. Oh, it's in quotes. Okay. It's got to be in quotes. So it turns out that LSTAT and RM both happen to look pretty good on their own, so maybe they'll look pretty good together. So I chose LSTAT and RM, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take just feature one, which was LSTAT. Let's see how that runs. All by itself, we get an RMS error of 6.2. So that's pretty good. I mean, it, it does something there. Now, what if I run feature two, which is RM? 6.6. 6. So may, maybe we solve the problem. And they both give about a six point whatever. But I can say, no, I would like a data frame that has both feature one and feature two and run that. And that's called multivariate because you have multiple variables. And we get it down to 5.5. OK, so now what that says is putting those variables together gives you more information than any one by itself. All right, and even though they, so these are both lines and sometimes you deal with things that are highly correlated. These are not so correlated that putting them together, there's enough information that you can build a better model with both of them. Of course, the, the natural next step is let's throw everything in the kitchen sink at it, and that's this bottom one. And in fact, it turns out if you put all those variables in there, you get an error of only 4.6. So that means combined in there, all those variables do a better job. Is that optimal in, um, in terms of uh, building your model? It is not necessarily. And if we ever have time to talk about variable reduction and Occam, Occam's razor, we'll do that. We don't have time. It is now 8 o'clock. I will stay as late as anyone wants. But what about any questions from the group? Yeah. You said the server was only going to be around for a week, and, but we could download the data if we wanted? Yes. So we um, what we'll do is on the end of the, the movie, the web page or the video page, we'll put up a static thing at the end or in the description. It'll talk about how to download it. It'll also talk about how to set up your own copy of Python and these tools. Okay, so we'll have a short description at the bottom of the YouTube video that will tell you that information. Other questions? Wherever he says. Okay, so the, the YouTube video is simple. Um, just go, or go to YouTube and type in Southern Minnesota IEEE or Southern IEEE and we should be the number one hit after that. And if you have any other questions, um, you can email me. Uh, I'm, I'm D. Paulson, P-A-U-L-S-E-N, at IEEE.org. Uh, Brian, I think you were set up. I think everyone's got Brian's email address because it was in that slide when you uh, had to email him your, um, email him your user ID.